Good morning, everyone. We are now one week away from the start of the school year for students. But I know many teachers and others are already back in their classrooms and that they've been working with their principals and superintendents for weeks in preparation. Working within the state's guidance, which outlines requirements and provides protocols from the Department of Health and the Agency of Education with a lot of input from pediatricians and infectious disease experts, schools have spent the summer being creative, transitioning classrooms and other shared spaces, creating outdoor uh, classes while rethinking and adapting curriculum for what we know will be a challenging and unique school year. And while we know most schools are taking a hybrid approach with three or more days of remote learning to start, this initial transition back to at least some in-person learning has taken creativity, flexibility, and commitment from many, many involved with our schools. I sincerely want to thank them for this work. I know it hasn't been easy, and Secretary French is going to highlight some examples shortly. As I've said before, a successful return to school is up to all of us. We've got to all pay attention. We've set health and safety protocols to help keep COVID out of schools and to limit the spread if, and probably more like when, it appears. Public health officials have given the green light for in-person learning because of the low prevalence of disease in Vermont. Now it's up to all of us to keep it that way. So while some may see our continued success as a sign we can let up, I urge Vermonters to stay vigilant. That means physically distancing, massing up in public, washing your hands a lot, staying home when sick, and quarantining when you've been exposed to someone with COVID or travel to a red or yellow county. These steps are critical to keeping our schools safe and helping to continue to move forward with our economic restart. So we don't have to take a step back as other states have had to do. Vermont continues to be a leader in our ability to suppress this virus. We have the lowest positivity rate and the lowest number of cases per capita in the country. This is thanks to the work of Vermonters and your commitment to keeping each other safe. But let me tell you how quickly that can change if we let our guard down. Eight weeks ago, Hawaii had the lowest number of COVID-19 cases in the country with under 1,000, while Vermont had about 1,200. That was then. Throughout July and August, Hawaii has averaged more than 120 new cases every single day. And as of this morning, they have 8,447 cases, more than five times what we have. This is a reminder of why we're doing what we're doing to suppress this virus. As we get our kids back to school with as much in-person instruction as possible, because we know it's best for our kids, this work is so important and must continue. My team is also pushing forward on our unique approach to set up childcare hubs for remote learning days. And Secretary Smith will share an update on that initiative in a few minutes. Whether it's K-12 schools, childcare, higher ed, retail, manufacturing, or healthcare, throughout this crisis, we've seen there are simply no easy answers because none of this is ideal. And there is no roadmap for this once in a century crisis. But Vermonters ingenuity, nimbleness, and a long history of neighbors helping neighbors has gotten us to this point and will see us through the months ahead. And I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith for his update. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, two weeks ago, we announced an initiative to stand up regional child care hubs as a key component of our initiative to provide expanded school age care on remote learning days. This is an effort to expand on our existing capability 
to build on our current successful programs as well as foster new ones to ensure that we can support our children and working families as best we can during this time. As we all know all too well, these are challenging times that require creative thinking, flexibility, and action. To be clear, we're working with our community partners to essentially create and implement an entirely new additional child care system that works under new circumstances. And we are doing that all within a matter of weeks. As has been the case throughout the pandemic response, Vermont is taking an innovative approach to addressing complex problems as quickly and as collaboratively as possible based on the unique challenges and perspectives we have. We have made significant progress to date on building out this school age capacity. Vermont After School has done a remarkable job taking up this challenge as the lead community partner. And we are grateful to them for collaborating with us on this endeavor. endeavor. The hard work and ex expertise they have brought to the table is incredibly valuable. We have also appreciated the local entities coming forward over the last week and, and offering their resources, their skills, their experience, running after school programs, summer camps, and other youth programming. This is a huge asset and will help Vermont set up the system while responding to the needs of working families. We also appreciate the wide variety of private businesses and other types of organizations that, while not having sponsored child care programs before, have really come together thinking creatively about what their employees and their communities need and are willing to contribute to innovative solutions. In developing the HUB, HUB program, careful thought is being given to establishing a system that helps with the immediate childcare needs for school aged children on remote learning days without harming the existence of the network we have in place right now for early childhood, after school, and youth serving organizations in this state. Wherever we can, we will continue to build upon the investments the state has made in Vermont's child care system throughout this COVID pandemic. The end goal is to have child care systems in Vermont for infant and toddlers, as well as school aged children that are stronger and more accessible. Just to provide an update since last uh, Friday, over 160 submissions have been put forward to either become a hub, provide space, or enrichment activities. On Friday, Friday, last Friday, we highlighted areas of the state where we are concerned, where we do not have enough capacity to meet the need. We are happy to report that the community response has been overwhelmingly positive and additional conversations with our partners at, at Vermont After School have either already happened or are scheduled to take place in the coming days in those areas. We are now up to 12 potential hub sites that have been identified. The hubs can be seen here on the map, uh, representing, represented by black, black dots. The map developed by Vermont After School has the reopening schedule of every school serving children in grades K through six. The shading indicates that reopening plans for that area. You will note that green means school is in person five days a week. Yellow is hybrid of in person and remote learning. And the orange areas are remote learning. Gray areas indicate districts which the approach varies by school. The hubs are in eight counties so far, the, the 12 potential hubs that I just mentioned. Addison, three, Chittenden, three, Franklin, one, Lamoille, one, Rutland, one, Washington, one, Wyndham, one, and Windsor, one. Combine these hub sites, these hub sites combined could provide approximately 2,300 childcare slots or the capacity to serve 4,600 uh, children. 
we can serve approximately over 4,000 children because the sites identified so far are all in schools that have split schedules for attendance. Also, I just want to make you aware there are an additional 20 sites currently finishing data gathering conversations with Vermont After School that will be then elevated to the DCF CD, CDD uh, for final vetting. Uh, those are represented in the blue dots on this map. Just to give you some of the idea, some of the activity that's happening out there, Essex Junction Recreations and Park is a hub site. They will serve eight schools. They anticipate having 700 child care slots available and have already filled those slots. We highlight this both to show that there is great need that this provider has filled and also to acknowledge that there is likely additional capacity needed to support all Vermonters who need this care. We continue to work to identify additional partners that could also support a program in that region. Mount, Abe, uh, Un Mount Abraham Union uh, School District expanding learning program in Addison County will be serving five schools. They have an estimated 240 slots with openings ready to take additional children. They have just located a site for their Wednesday program when all schools are closed and will have capacity for 100 children on that day. So the first 12 hub sites are working through their final stages with DCF this week. An additional 20 sites have applications actively in progress uh, with the expectation that they will move forward by Friday. Approximately 40 more potential sites are under review. As for whether we will meet the goal of meeting the 7,000 slots, Vermont After School along with DC, uh, DCF has done a great job so far in a remarkable short amount of time. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're working together diligently and quickly to build as much capacity as possible in the time remaining. But I want to be realistic here, and I've said this a couple of times at this press conference since we've talked about this program. Um, it may be that some sites come online after September 8th, but right now we're focused on building out the system as much as we can and uh, working diligently to do that. It's important to keep in mind that we are dealing with a fluid situation. There are some schools that may move more quickly to in-person days, and there is always the possibility that we will need to decrease in-person learning over the school year uh, if an outbreak occurs and the incidence of infection uh, increases. The hubs are responsible for connecting children to their education. The educational services will be delivered by the school system. Hub sites must have access to Wi-Fi and will support children connecting to their classes. This is in addition to providing children a safe, enriching environment to spend their day on remote learning days. Conversations with the Agency of Education around access to food have happened this week, and a clear communication tool is being developed to share with hub sites so they know who to contact with questions. I just wanted to give you an update. There's been a lot going on with these hub sites, and as you can see uh, throughout this map, a lot more will be uh, coming, forthcoming in the next few days. Uh, with that, and give an update on education and the progress there, I'll turn it over to Secretary Dan French. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Uh, good morning. I thought I would begin my update by addressing some of the data questions that have come up in the last few weeks. Uh, we are working uh, with our partners at the Health Department to design the data reporting for if and when uh, we have COVID-19 cases in schools. We are seeking to design an approach that strikes a balance between student and staff privacy with the needs of parents in a larger community to understand the public health trends. I thought I would share our initial work on organizing these data. 
Student health information is part of a student's educational record, and so it is protected by FERPA, or the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Staff data are protected by HIPAA. To address these privacy concerns, we are thinking of reporting the total positive number of cases in a school, with the number of student and staff cases combined. This means we would not report student cases separately from staff cases, and would not report student cases by grade level or class. Even with this level of protection, we have the issue of very small schools in Vermont. So our initial thinking is we would not report data on schools that have a combined student and staff population of fewer than 25 people. 25 is the number we arrived at after reviewing the size of our small schools and applying our best professional judgment relative to privacy restrictions and our current data practices. This means we will probably not be reporting data for about 15 of our schools. We believe a consistent approach to using these data at the state level will help schools with communicating with their families and their communities and can replace the need for districts to do this on their own. I think school level data will also be useful for highlighting our common purpose as Vermonters and supporting our students. By working together, we can ensure the safety of our students and school staff. When we look at our data relative to other states, it is clear we've been very successful, but we must continue to be vigilant to ensure our success in the future. Until we have a vaccine, we will likely have COVID-19 cases in our communities, which means we expect COVID-19 cases in our schools. We can minimize the likelihood of the disease entering our schools, however, if every Vermonter does his or her part in following the guidance from the health department. Our goal is not just to reopen our schools, but to keep them open and to provide learning opportunities equal to, if not better than, those pri provided before the emergency started. This will require everyone to work together. To monitor our progress on learning opportunities, we will be gathering data on school reopening plans and how they change over time. Commissioner Pichak gave a preview of these data last week by sharing a map of initial school reopening plans from around the state. When we announced our approach to hybrid learning back in July, I indicated we would be collecting monthly data pertaining to the patterns of student opportunity that were emerging as part of districts having flexibility in designing their own plans. The data we used in the demo last week were gathered manually by analyzing these initial reopening plans. We are using this initial information in the map to design a more automated process for gathering and visualizing these data. We intend to launch this new data collection in late September, or after we make the shift to step three, which we expect to make around the same time frame if conditions remain positive. The purpose of this data collection would be to monitor, monitor patterns of student educational opportunity. We think it is important to be able to understand how these patterns change over time, including how many students are involved in in-person instruction, remote learning, hybrid learning, and what the student grade levels are. As we approach the start of the new school year, I would like to thank all the administrators, teachers, and their school staff for their hard work in making the necessary preparations. When I talk with educators around the state, I consistently hear from them that this is some of the hardest work they've ever done. To highlight some of this work, I would like to share some of the preparations of the River Valley Technical Center in Springfield. River Valley Technical Center is its own school district, which is fairly unique structure for a tech center in Vermont. River Valley Technical Center is hosted on the site of Springfield High School. Also like, located on the site is the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative, which has done phenomenal work during the pandemic and rolling out a statewide online learning platform. In addition to serving the students at Springfield High School, River Valley also serves students from a larger region, including students from Green Mountain Union High School in Chester, Bells Falls High School, and Fall Mountain High School at Langdon, New Hampshire. The reopening plans for the Tech Center, therefore, had to be coordinated with all these districts, including a district from another state. The center began for its reopening by forming a committee that included teachers from its various programs, the lead negotiator of its teachers union, and its cooperative education coordinator. This core committee was augmented as necessary when it had to address specific issues, such as special education and student support services. The center's planning team considered the state's health guidance as a blueprint, walked through each of its elements, and applied them to the unique circumstances of the center. 
The center's plan addresses many specific logistical considerations, such as how students and where and how they will be dropped off and enter the center. Since students are coming from many different sending high schools, and the center itself operates separate morning and afternoon programs. Due to the hands-on nature of many of its programs, the center decided to implement a schedule of in-person learning for four days a week. For one day a week, all students will be engaged in remote learning. And for the first semester, some of its programs will be completely online, including its information technology and business and financial services programs. This complex schedule had to be coordinated with every sending high school. To do this, the center's leadership team held monthly meetings with all the principals throughout the summer to coordinate the schedules and transportation routes. Their success in collaborating demonstrates how valued these technical center programs are to both students and their communities. As one high school principal remarked, my kids won't come to school if CT is not open. The support for the center is also evidenced by the degree to which parent groups self-organized on social media to provide transportation and carpooling options for students. It has been observed that perhaps one of the more lasting impacts of this emergency on Vermont's educational system will be a stronger conceptualization of how to use remote learning technologies. Being co-located with Vermont Virtual has certainly given River Valley some advantages in that regard, but it's interesting to note how this emergency has expanded the center's use of online learning in new innovative ways. This innovation was stimulated by a strong commitment on the part of the faculty that they needed to take advantage of every opportunity to work in person with their students. As one instructor said, the first day will be like, hi, good to see you again. Now pick up your tool bags and let's get to work. To maximize the time for in-person instruction, the center purchased new digital cameras that operate in three dimensions and are motion sensitive. Instructors are using these cameras to record introductory equipment and procedure demonstrations. These video demonstrations are then uploaded to their online teaching platforms so students can access them 24 seven. I think the staff of River Valley Technical Center would agree that planning for the reopening of school this year has been some of the hardest work they've ever done but it's clear that their planning has paid off. Their reopening plan demonstrates a confidence in working together and problem solving that is representative of a high functioning organization. Like so many, of, so many of our educators, they leverage their expertise and use their best professional judgment to do what is best for their students and their communities. It is clear to me in reading their plan that not only are they ready to reopen their school, but they are also well prepared as a team to navigate the new challenges that this semester will inevitably bring. I would like to thank all Vermont educators and school staff who, like the staff of River Valley Technical Center, have worked so hard this summer to make preparations for reopening our schools. I think this work has been incredibly challenging because in many ways, we have asked our schools to do things they were never designed to do. Whether it's shifting immediately to teaching all students online, providing childcare, using school buses to deliver meals, or holding high school graduations in cars. It is also challenging because as educators, we cherish our routines and traditions, and to a certain extent, some of those routines and traditions have been disrupted. As we prepare to reopen our schools, however, we have the opportunity to create new routines and to reestablish a continuity of learning in the lives of our students so they can pursue their plans through education. Although this pandemic has been disruptive of our traditional school routines, we cannot let it be disruptive to the aspirations of our students. So thank you again for all, all the school personnel who have worked so hard this last six months in support of our students. I expect the reopening of our schools next week will go very well. Thank you to your, thanks to your dedicated service to our schools and our communities. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Secretary French. Last week, Vermont had eight new cases per 100,000 population. The national number was 88 per 100,000. We remained lowest in that as well as in percent positivity rate. There are so many things going on on the national scene and on the medical scene with regard to COVID. I suspect people 
and the public are having difficulty just keeping up with the onslaught. Being the cleanup hitter this morning and looking at the time, I'm going to restrict my remarks to what's going on here in Vermont right now. But I'll anticipate there'll be plenty of questions in the uh, Q&A with the media. So let me talk about the uh, Rutland County Killington outbreak. <clears throat> As we announced in a news release yesterday, the health department is investigating an outbreak of COVID-19 cases associated with people who attended a private party at the Summit Lodge in Killington on August 19th. At the outset, I want to first thank the management at the lodge, who have been eminently cooperative, for following the state's guidance to protect their guests and employees, and for their assistance and support of our efforts to contain this outbreak. To date, we have identified 14 cases among people who are at the party and among their close contacts which means the virus has spread to people who were not at the party. I understand this news potentially could be yet another worry for people in the community, but as I've said before, the efforts to contain outbreaks, whether we're talking measles, Ebola, COVID-19, this is what we do. We have systems in place to address public health situations, even ones that take a long time like pandemics. <laughs> And like we do for all break, outbreaks, clusters, and situations of cases in Vermont, our experts here at the Health Department are working nearly around the clock on this. <clears throat> Keys to our success are the actions that Vermonters take every day to keep yourselves and others safe. You know the drill. Masking up and keeping a six-foot distance from others, washing hands often and well, staying home when you're ill. There are serious reasons why we say this over and over. These seemingly routine actions have an important cumulative effect. They are a significant reason why Vermont is doing so much better than many other states and countries. So by taking these actions every single day, you reduce the chance you're exposed to the virus and you help protect others, especially people who are at risk of serious complications or worse. The Health Department's investigation began last week as part of our standard outreach to give guidance for isolation or quarantine to people who have tested positive. Our expert contact tracing team has been working to reach the more than 40 people who were at the party. Contact tracing is key to our ability to contain outbreaks, and I'll speak a little more about that in a few minutes. We appreciate the cooperation of those who have responded to our contact tracing team thus far, and we urge anyone who's contacted to please also respond to calls from the department. If you attended the August 19th event, but have not been in touch with the health department, please call 802-863-7240 to make sure you have the information you need to protect yourself and others. Because it's possible to spread the virus without developing symptoms, people who attended the event should also take steps to limit any possible exposure to others. If you attended the party, or if you are a close contact of someone who attended, monitor yourself for symptoms of COVID-19. If you have even mild symptoms, contact your healthcare provider to be tested. Speaking of testing, pop-up testing will be held in Rutland City tomorrow from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. at our local health office in the Asa Bloomer building. Registration is required. To register, go to healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19 slash testing. We are also arranging additional testing opportunities the remainder of the week in the area. I want to return to the topic of contact tracing for a moment. After a half year of experiencing this pandemic, contact tracing is a term everyone should be very familiar with. The concept may seem quite simple, <clears throat> reaching out to a confirmed case of COVID-19 and then their confirmed contacts, so they know what to do, how to prevent further spread of the virus, and have the information they need to recover and stay healthy. But contact tracing is not just a notification system. 
It is work that takes care, empathy, patience, knowledge, and expertise, both medical and in helping people handle news they generally don't want to hear. If you test positive for COVID-19, contact tracers will ask you questions about your symptoms and activities. They use your answers to determine when you were infectious and then who your close contacts were during that time, anyone you were within six feet of for at least 15 minutes. Contact tracers then reach out to these close contacts who may be at a higher risk of getting COVID-19 themselves. They give health guidance, answer questions, and provide support to people who may be stressed out or overwhelmed. Not an easy job, but I'm proud to say we're doing it well. Here in Vermont, 92% of cases are interviewed within 24 hours. This is a very high percentage, probably one of the highest in the nation. It does stand in stark contrast to news we've heard of other states and cities that have struggled to reach the people they need to, which means virus can and does continue to spread in their communities. While I want to give a lot of credit to our team for their time, expertise, and truly impressive commitment, I must give equal credit to the people of Vermont who understand the importance of answering the phone when we call, talking to us honestly, and doing everything they can to stop the virus in its tracks. This is public health. As a physician, I want everyone listening or reading my remarks to truly know there's no shame in being exposed or contracting the virus. If you made a choice to not wear a mask one day or attended a party where people were not taking precautions, then all I can ask is that you learn from that and make different choices the next time around. And don't let that keep you from working with us to contain the spread of the virus. We've run into a very few people who are uncooperative. I understand we all have different reasons for the choices we make. I may disagree, but I don't judge them. If you are contacted by a member of my team, I ask that you check your feelings at the door. When it comes to protecting the public health of Vermonters, we all have a responsibility to do our part, even if it's, a, even if it's as simple as picking up the phone when we call. Vermont is about knowing we can count on each other when it matters the most. Nine years ago, we were Vermont strong when we worked together, neighbor helping neighbor, to recover from Tropical Storm Irene. And despite the sense that COVID-19 is the new normal, it really is not. It's a long-term but finite public health emergency, one that we can end all the sooner if we work together again, each of us doing our part, even when it's inconvenient. So I ask all Vermonters to keep up the good work and thank you for doing so. And if you learn of a possible exposure or a case at your place of business, contact the health department and encourage any customer who tests positive to get in touch with us as well. All this will help ensure we can do the essential and proven work to containing this virus. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine, well said, and uh, I appreciate all your efforts. Uh, with that, we'll open up for questions. Calvin, we set them up as soon as we saw the trend of what what it was going to look like. Um, as you remember, there there we weren't certain how the various hybrid or in person or remote learning was going to be. But as soon as we saw the trend. Uh, we came out a couple of weeks ago because we saw how this was coming together and put this plan on on the table. Um, this is an unusual, you know, this is a unique, innovative way of looking at things as we've been with childcare throughout the whole pandemic. And one of the things that I, I'm most proud of uh, 
with the governor's support is what we've done with child care and making sure that child care has been uh, available throughout the pandemic uh, as well as opening up in, in a successful way back in June. Uh, you know, we provided for essential workers and opened it up to everyone back in June and kept the infrastructure in place um, by paying um, to keep the infrastructure in place. This is just another innovation about what we're doing and moving forward. And, and once we knew what was happening with the school year, I mean, if the school year was normal, we wouldn't be doing this. And once the school year goes back to normal, we won't be doing this. But given what we saw, uh, this is how we reacted, and I think reacted as quickly as we could. Yeah, to Secretary Smith's uh, point, you know, it's a very dynamic situation. Um, you know, looking back on it, we still had districts, I think, in the second week of August that hadn't finalized the reopening plans. And many who came out early with the reopening plans were revising them somewhere around the first week of August. Um, from my perspective, you know, this is how we've addressed many of our problems as they've emerged through the emergency. We collaborate very closely together. Our small piece of that was um, I, I heard from superintendents pretty consistently or started to hear somewhere around the first of August that they were having issues uh, with staffing uh, due to child care for teachers. So that piece of information I shared with the Agency of Human Services, and that, that led to us putting together this package uh, to serve uh, all Vermonters as well. But it's an iterative process focused on problem solving and, and getting it done to support the emergency response. And um, Secretary Smith, you mentioned that there may not be all of the hubs up and running by the eight. I'm wondering if you have a sense of maybe how many will have by the time school starts and maybe where some of the deficiencies I don't have that, Calvin, and where it's going to be. We're obviously trying to get as many up and running as um, uh, uh, by September 8th. Remember what we're doing here. We're putting a whole new child care system in place in a couple of weeks. Um, and that is uh, something I don't think we've ever done as a state. So the, the challenges are there. We're meeting some of the challenges. I can't give you a number right now because I don't have that number, but um, we are working to get as many up as possible by September 8th. And by the way, we aren't gonna stop there. I mean, once September 8th uh, rolls by, we'll continue uh, out. But as I said the other day, um, this is a Herculean task that we've, uh, we've undertaken. And the fact is, um, we'll have these up and running. The, the, the interest is there. It's just whether we'll have all of them up and running by September 8th. And my last follow-up question, Secretary, uh, <clears throat> Secretary French alluded to it, but the staffing issue as well. I'm wondering um, if the state has any sense of maybe where we might need additional staffing and if this is an issue and how we might be having it. Your, your question is about school staffing? Or um, child? The hubs. Oh, for the house. I'll take that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's going to be our biggest challenge as we as we move forward. As I said last week, what we're trying to do is um, get the staffing into place. Um, remember, we we have staffing for after school programs and those that we can draw on. What we what we have to guard against is making sure we don't poach from the existing system in order to staff what is a temporary system that we're putting up. So I think, you know, staffing is definitely one of the main challenges of this initiative. And but but I really feel along with our community partners, we're looking at how to effectively um, staff these with without draining the resources from the existing system. And and, um, you know, we'll have to see how how this goes as we move forward. I think if you're if you're um, saying what the number one challenge is, it's going to be staffing. But I'm optimistic that we will find the staffing, and I'm optimistic that um, you know it will be sufficient enough to have uh, quite a few of these hubs up and running. Just just to add uh, as well uh, as for those who are listening who are unemployed, we have 40,000 people unemployed in Vermont right now, either on PUA or additional unemployment. Uh, if you have an interest in uh, early uh, childhood care uh, and learning, 
um, reach out to us uh, because we could use the help right now. So um, I think that's an important factor as well. I want to remind everyone for those who are wondering why we didn't uh, anticipate this and work towards this back in the beginning of the summer. We're less than six months in uh, to this pandemic from an uh, emergency order standpoint. That was March 13th, uh, so less than six months. Uh, that was three months ago uh, when we started planning for the reopening of schools. And uh, I don't think any of us uh, could anticipate what was going to happen today. Uh, but we're doing the best we can. We'd hope for more in-person instruction. But again, we have to deal with reality, and uh, we're doing just that and putting into place uh, a system that I believe will be beneficial for the months to come. So I do believe there are both Vermonters and out-of-state people who attended the party. Um, concerning only in the regard that they may have left and traveled back to their state, um, but that's why health departments are connected with one another. And so we can provide that information to the other state. We also try to connect with anybody, no matter what their address is, because they may still be in Vermont. Um, and they still have public health at mind. So uh, their attention to their care is still paramount. Uh, actually, in regards to the Killington uh, situation, uh, and uh, on a separate issue with the education situation, um, on this breakout, do we, uh, are the contact tracers out within just the community, or are they going out of state as well? Fortunately, a lot of their work can be done by telephone. Oh. So uh, you never know always that a cell phone is in state or out of state. Uh, but at the same time, um, we know the names that we want to uh, address. And because the venue is so good at keeping the records that we asked them to. Uh, and then more recently, we've gotten information from the, the hosts of the party. Uh, we have phone numbers that we can rely on, uh, no matter where the person's located. So they did their job then at the, at the restaurant. Probably uh, advice for others who are welcoming people in as well. Yes, no, restaurants are required to you know keep, keep a list of those who um, eat at their venue or attend a function like that. Um, and the Summit Lodge did exactly what they uh, understood the guidelines to be. So. And on the education side, uh, we're now a week or so into the return of colleges. Uh, have we had any sort of update on <clears throat> testing, test results, where we're at with that? Are we seeing a problem yet? Um, so that's, let me start with the way you phrased the part of your question, are we seeing a problem yet? Because I'm not putting a spin on things, but if we saw zero cases, I would say we have a problem uh, because we have students coming from all over the place, mostly nationally and not internationally, but still places that uh, may have higher prevalence of virus than here. So we are seeing students who have tested positive. Some of them are testing positive before arrival, so they're being held up in terms of coming to Vermont. Others are testing positive on the day zero that they arrive or on day seven. Last number I had uh, from last week was 19 across all campuses. Uh, I suspect that's grown a little bit, but I don't have a, uh, an updated number for you at this point. Uh, I can tell you that these are people who are generally surprised at their result. They're not coming in sick and coughing and what have you, uh, with rare exception. So uh, they're asymptomatic people. Isolation, contact tracing, quarantining is being done on the campus, just as it's being done in communities like Killington uh, as a matter of routine, what we do. So most of the schools have uh, start dates that have either just happened or are happening in the very near future. Um, and there's nothing we see that's interrupting uh, their plans. Uh, just one last question for the governor. Uh, 
League of Cities and Towns has brought out their uh, their study or their recommendations as far as uh, changes in policing here in Vermont. Uh, have you seen any of those uh, recommendations or have any comment on that? Um, I have not uh, seen their recommendations at this point in time. Uh, we did uh, ourselves. Uh, I we issued uh, I signed an executive order um, and uh, has not made been made public yet. Uh, but uh, we'll be putting out a press release uh, in terms of policing and some of the uh, things that we believe uh, will be helpful uh, to Vermont. So that will be coming soon. Look forward to looking at uh, what VLCT has offered as well as what the legislature might be contemplating. Uh, hopefully uh, there's a common theme uh, that we're all trying to work uh, together in, in terms of trying to protect Vermonters, uh, but at the same time just change the way we do things. Uh, in uh, in light of everything that's happening throughout our country. So you're not ruling out state legislation? To no, I mean, uh, we're always willing to listen. We want to be better. Um, we want to, again, provide for the safety of Vermonters. I mean, public safety, from my perspective, is the highest concern of any government. And uh, we just need to find ways to do that and work together uh, in order to, uh, to accommodate that. So, yeah, we look forward to, to hearing that. I also wanted to uh, compliment the lodge in Killington as well uh, for being forthright, uh, for being helpful, uh, doing what they were supposed to do, uh, providing for the, the names of those who participated. And uh, I, I think it does highlight for those who are, are, are tiring of writing down those establishments that are tiring of writing down all the names and keeping track, this is exactly why we need that to happen uh, because it can uh, not only uh, help protect the families of those who uh, have been part of um, uh, the experience in one of these establishments, but also helping other states uh, when they go back home, uh, we want to protect them as well. So it's just a good idea and it's proved itself uh, to be essential. All right, moving to the phones, we'll start with April, Burlington Free Press. I have two questions, one real quick one for Secretary French. And my questions are, first off, you mentioned the data reporting for COVID cases in schools, and then also the, the data for the reopening plans. Will, will that information be housed on the Agency of Education website for all to see? That's a great question. I think uh, our inclination right now is the health information relative to COVID cases would reside on the Department of Health's website. Um, and the educational okay. reopening would be housed on the Agency of Education website. It's more of an educational issue, but that could change. We're still okay. we're still designing the data collections. Sounds good. And my second question: As schools reopen in step two, students will be eating in the classroom. Has there been any discussion at the state level for best practices to protect students with severe food allergies who could have increased exposure to allergens by having food in the classroom? Yeah, that hasn't come up uh, to my knowledge, but it is a good example of something that might emerge locally. But I would say our schools are very skilled at managing that issue. Um, that's, that's an issue that's been in our schools for a number of years. So uh, if it emerges as a statewide concern, we'll certainly address it. But I would expect the, the, the locals are addressing that right now. Okay, thank you. Steve, Penny K TV. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, I've got a quick one for the governor and then one for the doctor, if I may. Um, governor, I'm up here at the end of the Long Trail, and uh, I've shuttled hikers for like 15 years. And, but I still get calls uh, about parking and, and stuff like that for the Long Trail Terminus. Uh, is it like incumbent upon me to ask these people about quarantining or or, or, or anything like that? I mean, I, I didn't even think of it when uh, when I started getting calls at the beginning of the summer. Um, I'm just trying to understand the question. So when people come to to travel the long trail, they start there, and you're you're near that location. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they, they either drop the car off here and get a shuttle down to the bottom of the state or to where they had left off or, or whatever, but they usually leave their cars here in the village. Yeah, I, I, would, uh, I would recommend 
that you, you know, have the, the casual conversation with them, ask them where they're from, did they quarantine, uh, make sure they're wearing their, their masks and keeping uh, their distance from others. And if you're uh, in contact with them, make sure you have your mask on as well. I think just taking those simple steps uh, means the world a difference. But, but I think making them aware of our policies here in Vermont is helpful. Uh, okay, great. I'll, I'll bear that in mind. And um, <clears throat> I've uh, got one for Dr. Levine, if I may. Yep, go ahead, Steve. Okay, um, D Dr. Levine, um, let's see. Uh, in a nation of about 350 million people, we lose about almost 300,000 uh, people uh, fatalities a month. Uh, d just to attrition, and I was uh, looking at this uh, uh, the numbers that came out from the CDC on August 30th um, that said that only six percent of uh, of the fatalities from COVID were COVID only, uh, and that the 94 percent had other comorbidities or underlying uh, health conditions. And uh, so that means that only 9,683 had died from COVID only. And uh, they, they go through the top underlying medical conditions, uh, influenza, pneumonia, respiratory failure, hypertension, diabetes, vascular problems, dementia, you know, and, and whatnot. Um, is there, uh, I mean, for, for some people who are skeptics, uh, is, is there a chance that, that, that this may have been, uh, not now, but in the beginning, uh, it, it, not in the beginning, but, but now that it might have been, you know, been, been overblown in, in, in some way? And, and aren't we just postponing deaths, uh, not really preventing them? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I kind of anticipated someone would ask this today, so my answer is not directed at you. You framed the question really well. But I've already received a number of communications regarding this data uh, and uh, am very concerned about how, if I may term it, armchair epidemiologists and armchair physicians are uh, reporting their take on this. Um, because you actually do need to understand medicine and epidemiology to understand what the CDC came out with. So true, if we examine all the death certificates of everybody who's died of COVID in this country, 6% will say COVID was the only thing that killed the person. They were a healthy person otherwise. The other 94% have a variety of diagnoses on their death certificate. And you named a number of the diseases that are there, you know, respiratory failure, uh, hypertension, heart disease, all kinds of things, diabetes, kidney disease, the list goes on. Many of those do impact the most vulnerable in our society, which is why we are always trying to have everybody take all the usual precautions to protect the most vulnerable. Many of those affect people who have uh, compromised immune systems um, and sus make them very susceptible to disease. But it's, I have to make it clear that many of these people would not have died this year if COVID was not here. They've had this burden sure. of disease that they've lived with for sometimes months, sometimes years, sometimes decades. COVID tipped them over. It was overwhelming and their system couldn't handle it. It didn't mean they died of something else. They died of COVID in the setting of having all these other underlying diseases. And I hate to tell you, but lots of Americans have a lot of these underlying diseases. So. The answer is no, it wasn't all 15 and 20 year olds who have no problems and suddenly died of COVID. It, were, it was people who have other burdens, but they could be young, they could be old, 
Uh, but nonetheless, they died because COVID was here on the planet, just like many of them die during a flu season of the flu, where they're kind of in a fragile balance, but they can go on for years in that balance. But if they happen to get the flu, it can be overwhelming to them. And their death certificate shows they died of the flu in the setting of these other kinds of diseases. And so that's how death certificates are filled out. Um, the, the communications that are coming across the airwaves and to my email and whatever are saying, this was a hoax. There was no pandemic. Why have we put all these restrictions in place and kept our society from moving along and doing what it wants to do every day? Uh, this data should not give you that impression at all. Um, these are people who have died that wouldn't have died otherwise if there were no COVID on the planet. And I can't say that any more strongly. And we have 58 of them in our state. And because I feel so strongly, we should take just a few moments of silence in the memory of all of these people who died because COVID happens to be a pandemic on this planet right now. Um, sure. And uh, thank you. Th there's a uh, there was a New York Times study too of uh, a positive uh, test from three states: uh, New York, Nevada, and Massachusetts. And these tests said that they showed such small traces of the, the virus as to render them meaningless. Um, have you seen that study? Not the, and could you comment on it? Yeah, I believe that there was a uh, epidemiologist at Harvard who uh, is trying to make the case that there is a uh, portion of the population that we're testing who have COVID, we say, but the amount of COVID that's present probably isn't representing anything that could be infectious to anybody else or what have you. Um, this is very early and uh, lots of people, even colleagues at the same institution, the Harvard School of Public Health, were kind of taken aback by that. So I'd like you to kind of put it on pause for the moment and uh, we'll sure. see what evolves out of that. Uh, because you're right, that there was that report and I don't want to uh, misrepresent the way it framed things because I haven't read the whole thing myself, but it shouldn't change dramatically our thinking. Um, I do believe it, it was trying to make the case for uh, altering the way we approach testing in the population at large. And that is such a big uh, deal if that were to come to be that we should actually research that further and uh, be a little more uh, knowledgeable about exactly what they were trying to say. So stay tuned on that one, if you will. And, and we're on we're on track to lose uh, to lose uh, probably uh, to opiates. Uh, where it looks like the numbers we're on track to lose twice as many people in Vermont to opiates as to COVID. Is the has the Department of Health um, come out with anything new for the uh, for the opiate uh, problem? So there's a lot of ongoing pro, uh, programs that are going on right now. Uh, I, I hope your prophecy is untrue, that it would be double. That would, that would seem a little uh, on the higher end of the range. But let's uh, suffice it to say that the number of opioid unintentional overdose deaths this year is higher than it was the same time a year ago. And that's concerning. That's true around the country. It's related to the pandemic. It's related to uh, a lot of what goes on in terms of uh, being at home and being more isolated, not uh, having people witnessing injections, not having people aware of the, pack, the fact that somebody's injecting something that could be lethal and being there to rescue them, if you will. Um, heightened anxiety and depression related to uh, the, the pandemic, et cetera. So, uh, astutely, the uh, federal government through SAMHSA has actually uh, released more money, some of which has come to the Vermont Department of Health, to actually help us continue some of the preceding programming, make sure that all the treatment options remain open and available and not constrained in any way by the pandemic. 
uh, new rules that allowed for prescriptions to be done uh, remotely, uh, t like telemedicine, as opposed to have an in-person appearance to get one's prescription for medication-assisted treatment. Um, sure. And uh, there's, there's a, a numerous other initiatives that we've undertaken because our alcohol and drug abuse programming division is very aware of this data. They publish it, and we've been actually uh, targeting it to be uh, to be responsive in the way we can. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Guy Page. <laughs> Hello, Governor. First, I want to thank your, uh, the people who do your media lineup scheduling. Uh, you're doing a, a great job, and I really appreciate it. Uh, so the uh, question for Secretary French, I guess, uh, uh, his, his agency and the superintendents and legislature are looking at a uh, plan to use last year's enrollment figures for for uh, districts that had a lower enrollment, in, in part, large part due to homeschooling. Uh, and so two questions about that. The first one is, Secretary Frank, can, can you give me the most recent number in both in total and percentage uh, of homeschool applications to uh, agency of education? <clears throat> yeah, we're currently uh, expecting that number to be over 4,000. Uh, the applications are still, or have sort of a bit of a log jam. So uh, in the end, I expect the increase to be about a 100% increase over last year. Okay, so that's a good uh, So uh, given that, if I understand what I heard in the House Education hearing this week, uh, there'll be less, uh, there'll be the same amount of funding for districts with lower enrollment due to homeschooling or whatever, but districts that have an increased enrollment will still be able to use that average daily census uh, funding. Uh, so in a sense, uh, there will probably be fewer students, but more money, and therefore a, a, uh, a tax increase. So what I'm asking is, is it possible that some of this added revenue could go to help parents who are homeschooling for the first time, either you know, out of concern for their children's welfare or whatever. Uh, they're doing this for the first time and are maybe struggling with training, curriculum, and IT. Could, could your agency of education has been pretty nimble in, in meeting educational needs brought on by academics. Could this be one of them? That's a larger policy question. What's being talked about now is uh, freezing what we call average daily membership. Uh, and certainly, as you're right, the part of the issue is to uh, introduce some stability into the budget deliberations of our boards this fall, because we expect it to be a very uh, challenging budgeting process with so many variables. So we thought this would be one variable that we could at least uh, isolate and take off their plates. Um, but you know, to what extent the larger policy question around funding homeschooling, uh, that's really not what's going on with ADM. ADM isn't really about sending dollars to schools or dollars to kids, it's about the tax rate. Uh, which then gives districts the ability to make those investments. So that would be a whole separate conversation, and I'm not sure uh, the legislature is in a position to take that up right now with the, the funding issues are really the priority. So how about uh, an agency initiative to help out uh, homeschoolers given these sort of unique circumstances here? Yeah, we wouldn't necessarily have the ability under our own authority to do that. It would require the legislature uh, to, to enact a policy change in that regard. Okay. Thank you. All right, just a quick time check for everybody. 12.15 and we have 15 more callers in the queue. Mike Bielowski, True North Reports. Um, hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, so we received an email from a concerned mother who said she wanted to pick up her child from a soccer practice and she said her child could barely breathe. He was forced to wear a mask because of the COVID policies while running around exerting himself. I actually heard similar comments from my own children. Um, I have an eight-year-old in, in summer camp, and he, he kind of reiterated such as well. Um, what evidence does the health department have that playing sports and masks doesn't cause harm? 
Dr. Levine, I'll have uh, him answer that, but I, I would also like to offer uh, that these are unusual times. I think there's a lot of evidence uh, in terms of uh, masking and uh, providing for the, the spread of this, uh, this disease uh, and transmission of this disease uh, through the droplets. And uh, that's why we've taken some of the measures uh, we've taken here in Vermont. And I think uh, sports is one of them. It's been difficult uh, in terms of decisions because we want them to have that social uh, type of interaction, but we want them to be safe. We want to keep others safe as well. So uh, difficult times, challenging times, but uh, we just need to persevere and work through these. And I think that there has to be some recognition that maybe um, there needs to be more breaks uh, during games, that uh, you want to make sure that uh, you're giving uh, time uh, to the kids uh, to rest and, and catch their breath and so forth. So, but all the while keeping each other safe. I just have a couple words to add to that. Um, the scientific evidence about impairment in your physiology, if you will, from wearing a mask, very minimal evidence, unfortunately. So, though I can't tell you it strengthens your respiratory uh, effort, uh, I can also tell you that there's not enough out there to indicate that it can be harmful, um, but there's very little research, uh, unfortunately, done because who's going to be doing research on this in the past before we had a pandemic? I don't think most people were wanting to wear masks when they engaged in any kind of physical activity. So um, on this one, as the governor's kind of indicated, we know the benefits of masks, and we know that in close contact sports, there's clearly going to be the opportunity for people to be breathing heavily uh, in close proximity to one another. We also know that there's opportunity just in the act of yelling and screaming uh, for people to transmit virus. Whether they happen to be the players on the field who will be doing that, or definitely the people who will be doing it who are on the sidelines. Uh, so having this uniform policy seems to be the right thing to do, uh, even though we don't have as much scientific data as you'd like us to have. So, so is it fair to say for the moment we don't have clear data weighing the risk of these kids wearing the mask versus not wearing the mask in like a soccer game or a gym class? That's right. Uh, but we just don't have okay. enough data that says there's harm in doing so. Uh, well, well, thank you for your time. Greg, the county courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, hey. I'll just ask for a couple updates on my questions last week. Uh, first, do we have any numbers on the uh, testing at the DMV this year versus previous years? Um, I thought I answered that last week. I didn't think that we needed to go into that unless we thought it was really, really important. Uh, it's not that, that we don't have uh, some of the data um, from previous years. We just haven't kept track of it this year. Um, but I'm sure we can go through the exercise. But we're pretty busy in DMV trying to renew licenses and, uh, and find registrations and put this new uh, in-person uh, type of uh, operation into place. So I'd hate to take away from any of their work uh, to, to provide the information unless it's really, really important. But well, I mean, I it's, not, it's not that it, it can't be done. It's all math, but it just takes time. Yeah, it's, it's my understanding, and I, I could be wrong. Maybe you could clarify uh, that there are, you know, at least some state employees right now that are still out on administrative leave unable to return to a work setting that, that I would think would probably want to, you know, maybe get their hands dirty and, and I, I'm not aware of, I'm not aware of any who are um, not doing anything at this point. So, so are all the uh, state employees uh, back to full time workload? Um, I wouldn't say that all uh, state employees are back uh, to full-time uh, in the traditional sense, uh, but we have never stopped working. I mean, we've done it remotely, 
um, and we've just been doing it in a different way. So again, I mean, if this is really inf information that's vital, uh, we haven't seen a sharp, a sharp uh, uh, increase or decrease in the numbers that I'm aware of. Um, we tried to put into place a, a system where we could get uh, kids that testing uh, so that they could get uh, to where they wanted to be and on, on the uh, road, so to speak, uh, to the next chapter of their life and experiencing driving on the roads. Um, so I, I can't say that we've seen any anything dramatic one way or another, and, and I'm not sure you know, getting going through the exercise of providing information is going to make a difference one way or another. Unless I'm missing something, okay. I just, I just, I'm just not aware of what, what good use this would provide. But again, we could do it. It's just going to take a little time. Okay. Uh, I guess moving on, uh, was your staff able to find any information about the law enforcement issue in Richford and the and the secondary effects of moving a large number of people into that community and? And, and what kind of things might Richford expect? Yeah, uh, from the state? you know, I'm, I may uh, refer to Commissioner Sherling uh, this because I did ask they look into this. Um, it wasn't uh, quite to the magnitude that we thought. Um, it was a very limited number of people, and actually, talking with <clears throat> some folks in Richford, uh, they were they were more. Uh, concerned about uh, the welfare of the kids, wanted to provide for something for them to do, and they were willing to work as a community uh, to try and fulfill that. So that's, I believe, what we found. Um, Secretary Smith or Commissioner Sherling? Secretary Smith. Thanks, Greg. I followed up on your uh, questions from last week, including sort of the presumed behavior of motel guests, including complaints that juveniles were vandalizing uh, the park in the area. And while um, we cannot disclose the specific of individual cases, it's worth noting that children in households receiving emergency housing in that community are lar largely under the age of three. I think we have two that are not under the age of three. and and they are under the age of 10. And regarding concerns that these people are being housed in the community from other places, again, while we can't disclose the specific cases, all the households being served are from the northwest, from northwestern Vermont, and almost all are from the immediate surrounding communities. Just so that everyone knows, Homelessness happens in most places, in, can happen in more places in Vermont than many people in towns wish to acknowledge. And the harsh reality is that Vermonters experience homeless and housing insecurity. They're our neighbors and our friends and our community members. Um, and the general assistance program, the general assistance motel program, has been there for 50 years to help these Vermonters. And we do that because people are attached to their communities and we like to house them uh, to their communities. One of the other things that I heard regarding the prospect that the state of Vermont needs uh, to provide more law enforcement, I'll let, um, the, I'll let Commissioner Sherling talk about that, but um, people experiencing complex trauma and unforeseen and sometimes devastating crises, uh, they, they need connection and help, not more law enforcement. And we have been surrounding a lot of these um, places with extra services to provide that help. And if we look at the model of success around the state, there have been some really successful models, including Rutland, where we've worked with local uh, law enforcement. And so I just want to, this is, the portrayal was that this was a huge amount of people um, causing problems and that kids vandalizing um, uh, the parks in there. And what we found is it's probably a small group of people in this program, in that community, and the kids are uh, from infant to uh, t under 10 years old. So uh, that's what we found. And Commissioner Shirley, do you have anything to add on that? 
just a, a bit, Secretary Smith. I think the secretary covered the vast majority, including uh, you know the importance of, of wrapping services around folks that are uh, in any kind of uh, uh, crisis or need, uh, rather than it being an enforcement issue. Um, it is, uh, as far as we know, a relatively small number of people, uh, not as originally portrayed, somewhere uh, fewer than a dozen. And uh, there's no indication that we're aware of uh, that there has been a significant increase in law enforcement call volume as a result uh, of any of the activity that's happening there. So uh, what, what was said during the meeting on Thursday uh, by the lieutenant was that um, they don't have the personnel to deal with it, partially because the community of Richford is so far outside their core service area, and partly because they're just understaffed. So is the Department of Public Safety unable to adequately staff uh, law enforcement in Richford? No, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the version that I heard, uh, there appears to, to lack some context in, in, the, uh, in the content of your question. Um, so I'm not sure what exactly that was in response to. Um, but there is no indication that we have a resource deficit or, or an increase in call volume for that matter. Okay. Well, um, I will have to go back to the recording because I, I certainly have down differently from, from what I took down for notes at that meeting. I guess that's it, Governor, unless you have anything to add. I'm all set. Thank you. Wilson? Thank you. Thank you for your time. Wilson, the AP. Uh, hi, I, I hope uh, I hope this is a quick question, um, Governor. I was interested about your comments when you first started about Hawaii, which for so long uh, was, was stayed along the bottom of the, I guess, affected and infected states here through, throughout the COVID, and now Hawaii is skyrocketing. And it seems like some of the other smaller states uh, that had circumstances similar to Vermont are also seeing some pretty significant increases. Are you, do you think that Vermont can keep these numbers down, or do you think this is something that uh, uh, just by chance at some point something will happen to, to make something explode to be much bigger than, say, the Killington um, incident that the health department is now following? Yeah, history uh, will be the judge of that, uh, Wilson. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that Vermonters, that's why I keep talking almost every single week, uh, every single press conference about the, the need for us to remain vigilant, to do all the things that we're doing now and improve upon that. Um, it's so vital. Uh, and when we hear of a case like in Killington uh, and where we need the information so that we can do the proper contact tracing, it's, it's incumbent upon each and every one of us uh, to provide that information because that allows us to mitigate and suppress the virus. And that's what we've been trying to do over the last uh, five to six months uh, and improving upon, you know, we always have room for improvement. But I think what happened in uh, Hawaii, for instance, I think they did open up their economy. Obviously, uh, you know, like Vermont, uh, they are reliant on hospitality and lodging, restaurants and so forth. I believe they opened up uh, some of those uh, entities and didn't have uh, sufficient contact tracing to follow up uh, as a result and didn't take some of the measures that we've taken. So we're trying to learn from that um, and, uh, and again, watch other states and see what they do that could be better uh, than what we do and uh, take advantage of that. But, but I'm, I'm, you know, the bottom line is, can we, can we keep this up? Sure, we can. Uh, but it's up to us to make sure that that happens individually. It's not just the government. It's individually uh, taking all those steps that I keep talking about, making sure you wear your mask, uh, stay uh, physically separated uh, from others, and, uh, and the large social gatherings, uh, staying home when sick, all those simple measures. Wash your hands a lot. That's the key. It's very simple. But, uh, but sometimes, you know, we get complacent uh, because we see that we're doing well. That's my fear that everyone, you know, we believe our own magic and, and then uh, we don't believe there's a problem. And many people don't think there has been a problem from the beginning, as we uh, heard from another uh, question earlier. 
And for those who, who think this is a, some sort of hoax, you know, tell that to the 58 people and family members of, of family members of those who have passed away in Vermont, or the over 9,000 in Massachusetts, or the over 33,000 in New York, over the 185,000 across the United States. Tell that to them. And then think about if we hadn't taken all the measures, all the steps we've taken here in Vermont, if we hadn't done everything, shut down some of the, the, uh, the, the restaurants and hospitality and businesses and so forth that, that were really counter to everything I believe in, if we hadn't done that and hadn't taken these steps, my guess is uh, we would be facing a vast, a much larger a death rate, much larger case count throughout this state and throughout the whole United States. So we wouldn't be talking about 185,000 people. We'd be talking about hundreds of thousands more. And uh, that's why it's important for us to persevere, see through this until a vaccine uh, comes to be. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Kat, WCAX. Hi, this question is likely for Mike Smith. I was looking for an update to your long-term care guidance. Several families have reached out to us wanting to know what the status is of the health department's look into possible revisions to help families reconnect with their loved ones who are in long-term care facilities. Where does it stand and when can families expect to hear an update about it? Thanks, Kat, for the question. I just want to make sure that people understand that we do allow visitation at long-term care facilities, and I'll get probably to the question you're asking for, Kat. They have to go through several phases, and those phases are sort of in the guidance that, that we have issued. Uh, uh, phase zero means there's no visitation. Phase one is we allow, um, uh, phase one is allowed when a facility has gone 14 days with no cases and there is no substantial community spread and that allows for outdoor visits up to two visitors as long as mass and distance uh, distancing is maintained. We have phase two, which allows visitors um, can be outside and increase up to four. Uh, Non-essential healthcare and contractors are allowed as well as non-medical necessary medical visits. Uh, some communal dining and group activities are also allowed. And then uh, phase three, of course, is with the most um, sort of 42 days with no cases. Phase two, by the way, is 28 days with no cases. And no community spread has all the phase two and as well uh, indoor visits are allowed. The, the thing that we have been struggling about, and frankly, uh, what I've been struggling about from a personal perspective, knowing what we went through and the and sort of the the anxiety that we went through on long-term care facilities when this when this hit is what Essex New York is struggling with right now as the virus is going through a a long-term care facility there and trying to guard against any of that happening we're still looking at the procedures for uh, what what you brought up in a press conference a few weeks ago which is the uh, personal contact, the touching um, of, of individuals at, at uh, long-term care facilities. And as you know, um, and as I said a couple of weeks ago, you know, this pandemic has really upset all aspects of our lives. And, and in those conditions, it's almost harder to see your loved ones and not be able to give them uh, a hug or a handshake or interact interact with them that the ways that you usually do and we understand that and uh, and and as I said as you reached out and as other reached out it's it's had a profound impact on us at the same time also has had a profound impact is when we've seen the results of what can happen if this virus enters these facilities so just to give you an update the health department and myself are still looking into possible ways to make small changes to these regulations. And I want to emphasize, they probably will be small changes to these regulations to feel like um, uh, what we're used to with small amounts of contact uh, while keeping our facilities uh, safe and healthy. So I st still stay tuned. We're, um, uh, this is a very 
very delicate decision that we'll, we will be making uh, in the future. So I believe some states have policies that allow a designated family member to visit their loved one in a long-term care facility at least once a week, once they've been tested for COVID-19 and they agree to limit their movements. Could Vermont do a strategy like that? I'm, I'm being very specific because I think families that we've heard from are getting pretty nervous as they head into fall and they notice the weather is going to be less amenable to outdoor visits and they do not see a way forward for indoor visitation heading towards the colder months. We've given and not hearing a timeline from the state about when they might know how they can see their loved ones is frightening for them. There is a path to indoor visitation. It's through the phases that I just outlined, and that's up to the institution. We have provided the path to get to indoor visitation. The issue is whether the facility, which has the right to make stricter regulations than we have uh, proposed, there is a path to indoor uh, visitation. I think the question that you asked us, which is a is a heartbreaking uh, discussion and at the same time one that we're just struggling with to find the right balance is the touching aspect of of loved ones and we're we're still struggling with that but Kat I, I want people to know we have a path to indoor uh, visitation through the various phases and the last question on this we heard from a family who said you know my loved one isn't dying from COVID but their mental state is deteriorating rapidly because they're not getting the same kind of um, family contact and stimulation that they were prior to the pandemic. I guess what's the message for families who say we're, we're never going to get this time back with our loved ones and we're sitting here waiting for the ability to connect again with them in the way that we used to. You know, I can understand that you said it's difficult as we look at the balances of health versus desire to reunite families what they're used right. to but i think some families aren't aren't particularly um you know but feeling good about the idea of how long this is taking to come up with just remember kat they can visit their loved ones and i would urge them to do so but at the same time we got to remember it's just not those their loved ones that we're looking out for these congregate settings in some cases house hundreds of people um, that haven't made the same decision in, that these uh, people are saying, you know, just let me do it, uh, you know, and the consequences we'll deal with as a family. Those consequences just don't stay to one family. They can go, they can go to multiple families throughout this. I do want to emphasize, I understand profoundly what people are feeling out there, but you also got to understand that we have to protect people um, in these long-term care facilities. When one case gets into these long-term care facilities, as we're seeing right now in Essex, uh, uh, New York, and as we have seen here, where the majority of our deaths have happened in our long-term care facilities, when one case gets in there, sometimes it just doesn't affect one case. It affects the whole facility. And that's what, uh, that's what we're struggling with right now. Thank you. All right, uh, folks, I just have to ask you to, to not uh, go through, maybe if you have several questions, if something is leaving until Friday, because it's 1240 and we still have 11 in the queue. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Secretary French, uh, Vermonters often mention the inconsistencies coming out of the state at several levels uh, in COVID-19. Today appears to be another classic example. Uh, on one hand, Dr. Levine says there's no shame with COVID-19. He doesn't judge people. I doubt Vermonters have judged anybody negatively, but the education agency is now taking a bunker mentality when it comes to withholding COVID information in the schools itself. And you probably know that your secrecy plans aren't going to fly too well with parents and most likely teachers wanting to know about COVID within the schools. Shouldn't parents be allowed to know what's happening with their children in their schools and actually the employees know about their own work sites? Uh, and who exactly were the transparency experts 
the education agency used during your discussion about trying to keep the public actually informed? Um, before I turn it over to Secretary French, I did want to mention, uh, very sorry to hear about your sister uh, this past week, Mike. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Governor. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, to a certain extent, I agree. Uh, you know, the public does, and parents specifically, do have an interest in that information, which is why we're trying to strike that balance. As I mentioned, I think our initial modeling looks at uh, all but 3% of Vermont schools uh, falling into having reportable data. So we think that's uh, erring on the side of being very uh, transparent. Um, I think in terms of our internal process, uh, our, our head data person, Dr. Wendy Geller, and our general counsel, Emily Simmons, uh, have been my two primary folks I've been relying on uh, to start, once again, the design process where we consider what are the uh, sort of requirements from a FERPA standpoint and from a HIPAA standpoint. And then uh, we've be begun conversations with the Department of Health, which I gave an update on today. So it's a collaboration between the two agencies on how to strike the appropriate balance in this information. Well, we, we, we've heard earlier that HIPAA does not apply it's been blown out of the water. Uh, Dr. Levine and others initially used that. Statistics are not covered. We've asked to where in the HIPAA regulations. Nobody's been able to point that out. So that's been dispelled. And I don't know if your staff didn't realize that. But, but again, who were the transparency experts that you got from outside that the education, uh, I mean, the education agency is not always the most forthcoming. And I'm not saying your administration long before you got there, they, they just have not been known as being the most transparent agency in the state. So what outside experts did you get to balance the public's right to know about what's going on in their community? As Dr. Levine said, he's not being judgmental. Vermonters aren't judgmental. When people catch the flu, we don't hold it against them. Why would you think people are holding it against people for having COVID? I don't understand. I think that's what Vermonters are baffled with and the inconsistency. Well, you know, to your fir first question, we haven't consulted any outside experts. I think we have sufficient expertise internally. Uh, we do have sort of a unique interplay with this information inside of education. As I mentioned, we have a standard called FERPA, the Family Education Rights Privacy Act, uh, which in school information, even though it might be HIPAA information uh, in the outside world, inside of schools, FERPA is a much higher standard. So we have to rely on our internal experts uh, to, to uh, you know, factor in that criteria. Uh, but I think, I, you know, I would just say give us a chance. Uh, what I was trying to do today uh, was to say this is our initial thinking on it to stimulate a conversation. Um, we know uh, we're going to have to address this issue, and we're trying to be transparent. Uh, this whole point of today of providing that initial thinking on it. Um, so we look forward to continuing the conversation with Vermonters about this very important issue. So that 25, did I understand you correctly? It's a random number, apparently. Is that the number you're going with, 25 in a school? Yes, we looked at uh, you know the, the reporting uh, criteria the, the health department uses, and we started to model out uh, you know the size of some of our schools, um, and we thought 25 was a, a good uh, cut point on that. So that again, that was just uh, throwing a number and hitting the dartboard. Nothing in particular about it. Uh, not so quite. That, as I as include, I said in my that include, does that include parents? Excuse me. Does that include teachers, faculty, staff? volunteers or is that just students? Yeah, to, to your point about it, it's not a dartboard. As I, 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 in my earlier comments, spoke about our professional judgment and uh, expertise, which is considerable in that regard. Uh, but we, our modeling is based on an assumption of total population of employees and students, does not include volunteers and parents that might enter the building. It's just strictly uh, employees and students. So it's not really 25 then. It's, if, if there are people volunteering in the classroom, does it include the school administration? Does it include the custodians, all the staff, and everybody like that? Yeah, we're, we're thinking of school employees and students to do a composite uh, figure for cases, because we think the public has an interest in the cases in a school, regardless of whether they're students or staff. So volunteers going into classroom won't be counted? Well, my initial thinking is no, because they're not considered employees. Okay. 
Thank you very much. You're welcome. Jolie, local 22. Hi, can you hear me? We can. All right, um, I have a question for uh, Secretary Smith. Um, uh, could you explain uh, what makes these educational hubs new and different? The, the child care hubs? Yeah. Yeah. Secretary Smith. New because we've never had them before. Um, and different is because we're setting up a program that not only looks from K to five, uh, excuse me, from uh, zero to five, but also K to six um, in days that we traditionally don't have to um, set up programs for that because they're in school during those times. So it is new and different in that regard. We are setting up a system that we've never set up before uh, and uh, setting it up for school age uh, children uh, during school times uh, that uh, normally we wouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I do have one question for Secretary French. Um, do um, schools have emergency plans in place if they suddenly needed to go remote, uh, given that um, schools across the nation have seen um, increases uh, in COVID cases? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's not so much they have emergency plans, they have plans. Uh, our whole assumption was that districts would have some flexibility among in-person, remote, or hybrid learning. So um, essentially, from the very beginning, we've baked into that sort of flexibility into our design. Uh, so we think that sets schools up well to uh, have to navigate these challenges that will no doubt emerge. All right, thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor, I have a question about the spigot, but I just wanted to FYI to Dr. Levine. I've been riding the, the bus here in Burlington the last couple of days, and they've been very crowded, and there was only one person not wearing a mask, so, so that was pretty encouraging. As far as this, uh, turning the spigot more on the, on the general economy, you mentioned that the schools and the colleges uh, in themselves are kind of a spigot turn. Uh, as far as the general economy is concerned, are you waiting to see how the, the schools and the colleges, how the, how the health data plays out, and is there a timeline where you'd make another economic turn? Yeah, we, you know, to be perfectly blunt, perfectly honest, uh, highest priority right now is to uh, open up the schools, um, K through 12 in particular and trying to make sure that we're not doing anything detrimental that would affect that. So we, uh, we are watching, um, and as soon as we possibly can uh, get through this, uh, at this first reopening, hopefully successfully, uh, then we will look at uh, focusing on the economy uh, to try and open up uh, certain hospitality in particular uh, to get back to some sort of normalcy. But so there isn't, uh, you know, three weeks after the opening of schools, if all looks good, then yeah. you'll the as, as we've done since the very beginning, really watching the data, the science, uh, what we're seeing on the ground, you know, the number of cases, and uh, some of what uh, Commissioner Pichek, uh, the the four guidelines uh, that we we use to model and open up the. The, the traveling network we're using here as well. So we'll just have to play it by ear uh, and. Uh, and hope uh, that we are moving in a forward positive direction uh, so that we can, again, reopen the economy, which is so essential, especially as we head into the winter months. Uh, and I'm very concerned, uh, as I've said uh, previously, about next year's budget. We, we made, made it through um, because of the great year we had last year. Uh, it would have been even better had we not had the, the COVID uh, uh, the pandemic uh, hit us uh, here in the first uh, or the last quarter of this past fiscal, fiscal year, uh, but that helped us get through uh, last year and provided us enough surplus to get us through this uh, next fiscal year. The one after uh, fiscal year 22 uh, is going to be very challenging because we're not going to have the surpluses because there won't be. Uh, and we need to focus on uh, the, the revenue generators, the employers, uh, to put people back to work uh, to restart this economy uh, more fully. Again, those 40,000 people who are out of work right now, uh, we need to get them back into employment. All right, great. Thanks, Governor. 
Pam Davis. Uh, hi, this is a question. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Levine. I'd like to return to the first question, one of the first questions he got in this press conference, which is the the question, uh, what, what I think is seemed to me broader. Now, I may, I may be wrong, and, and, uh, and he knows it better than I do, but here's, here's my question. Um, the uh, looking at the testing per se had two or three elements in it. One of them was whether, um, whether as the original questioner said, the the, uh, the, the uh, PCR test is picking up uh, people with very low levels of very low levels of the disease. Um, and the question then was twofold. One was whether it was whether it's worth uh, refining your reporting, okay, to distinguish between people who have a clear dangerous load of the virus and those people who don't. A second question. A second question was. Should we modify the PCR test in order to uh, run fewer cycles, and, and uh, which would you still using the PCR test would um, pick up much few, many fewer um, positives? Uh, I think also that the question uh, that the, the question is much broader than one individual at Harvard. I think there's at least half a dozen states that are considering moving. And the last part of the question, and it gets back to the Manchester situation. One of the things, if somebody decides that you really, and some states may do this, uh, which are having uh, huge uh, testing problems, if they switch to an antigen test, uh, then that's a very different proposition. And one of the things that I have not heard about anywhere else in the country, but we have definitely seen here, is a is uh, the Manchester case where uh, the antigen test. Uh, which is not supposed to have any, or very few, if any, po false positives. It's got a huge number of false positives. But I would just ask Dr. Levine, I'm going to stop in a minute, but it just, it's, what I'd like to ask Dr. Levine to look at is when you call, when you call the, the clinic, the clinic in Manchester, what they tell you is that Dr. Levine, in a press conference down there or, or about there, said that all of those cases that they found to be positive were in fact positive. I think that's a huge problem. I wonder if you could address that. Thank you. Must anyone forget the first question? Um, what Ham is referring to is called cycle thresholds, CT values. The lower the value, the more infectious someone is. It has to do with how many cycles the PCR cycle needs to go through to detect the virus. So the lower number of cycles it has to go through, that presumably means there's more virus in that person that could infect someone. If it has to go through many, 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 many more cycles, uh, that might mean there's hardly any viral material to detect. But it is detecting it because it's such a powerful test. And maybe that person isn't so infectious. So um, these are all wonderful thoughts. Um, you know, they haven't been rigorously tested um, in terms of uh, changing policies, but they're, they're all important considerations. And as we learn more and more about the virus, like we do all the time, uh, states will need to start considering or reconsidering how they go about things. I'm a little concerned because there's also an issue of where is a person in their natural history with the virus. So if the person is early on, presumably they may have a higher infectious load and burden than a person who's later on. And if they didn't have a lot of symptoms from the start, it might be hard to tell from just talking to the person their understanding of how infectious they might be because they never really felt that bad in the first place. So it's, it's a very challenging set of questions you ask him about the cycle threshold and adjusting what states do so that you would do the same test, the PCR test, across the board, but you would have a cutoff point so that your uh, machine, your instrument, wouldn't actually go through more cycles than you preset it for. So that would take a lot of the people who may not have as much ability to infect others out of the picture 
because they would be listed as a negative test because they hadn't yet reached that point in the cycle where they'd be positive. Um, I think that needs a lot more thought and a lot more uh, testing rigor, to be honest. Right now, I'd rather feel a little more comforted by trying to pick up most people. Uh, and even if I'm picking up some people who may not be so infectious, I'm not too worried about that right now. Uh, but I do understand that there are states that are very challenged by getting enough testing done uh, for a variety of reasons and maybe looking for a way to maximize the yield, get a bigger bang for their um, whatever, because of the fact that uh, they're doing it this newer way. I haven't heard a lot of traction for this idea just yet, so uh, stay tuned. With regard to um, Manchester um, and the antigen test that, uh, that they do, again, I've said all along, this test has a role to play and it needs to uh, be utilized uh, cognizant of what that role is. There was a conflict or a discordance between the results on the antigen test and on the PCR test, and even more importantly to me, a discordance between the results of some of the tests and the epidemiology surrounding the uh, work we did to determine if there was an outbreak or not. Um, the FDA has done its uh, analysis of how the machine performed, if you will, and the company, Kaidel, similarly has investigated uh, how it was utilized, and um, they determined that a positive test by that machine was a positive test. And we're not actually arguing with that at all. What we're really doing is trying to get at more of why is there this discordance, and that has not yet been resolved at this point in time. Hope I covered all three of your questions. Yeah, on the money. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, it's about 1 o'clock, and we have seven callers in the queue, so folks, please uh, limit, it, limit your questions, uh, and we can always follow up directly with Ethan and I or the health department afterwards. John Dillon, VPR. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Levine, getting back to the Summit Lodge situation, from, from what we know, was anything done wrong there at that party? Um, were folks wearing masks? Were they you know, not quarantined if they were from out of state? And, and if not, if it was just a gathering and this happened, is this just what the public should expect in, in a pandemic? Um, without a vaccine? Um, so I would hope this is not what we should expect uh, because obviously we have increased the size of mass gatherings and we feel that responsible people at mass gatherings can actually attend those. Uh, we wouldn't want to put them at risk. Uh, repeat that uh, we don't feel the lodge itself did anything wrong. Uh, they adhere to a lot of the guidance with regard to the list, with regard to sanitizers, hygiene, etc. Um, I don't have enough detail and I don't think we'd ever understand without complete video of the entire several hours people were there um, how adherent anybody who was there was to uh, all of the, the rules and guidance that we've uh, labored over talking about today as well as other days. Uh, but the fact that we have a large number of contacts tells me that at least using the bare minimum rule of being in contact without a mask, uh, possibly for 15 minutes within six feet, must have happened a fair amount there. Keep in mind it was a party, people were dining outdoors, um, walking around, I'm sure, with, with food and not uh, interested in trying to eat with a mask on. Um, so that's all I can tell you. Um, people have to be very extraordinarily careful. Were there people there who were supposed to be quarantining and not? Uh, I don't think we're going to, to know that unless they directly uh, would, would say that to us. Um, there were plenty of Vermonters there, so uh, presumably they, unless they had traveled, wouldn't need to have quarantined. Okay, thank you. Aaron, VP Digger.
Um, I should also like to note that Paula and Chuck I have a few he's the one that's listed right after me, so you can just get past his name. Uh, this question is for the governor. The legislature set aside a hundred million dollars to help cover K to twelve schools cover the cost of reopening during the pandemic. But your budget didn't include any additional funding. Why didn't you include additional money in your budget? Well, first of all, a hundred million dollars is news to me. Uh, had they covered, or if they had set it aside, uh, that would have been in the first quarter budget. So maybe um, if somebody could point out uh, to me where they stipulated that they were putting $100 million uh, aside uh, for education, um, I could comment further. But uh, I don't have any knowledge that it was included anywhere, unless you, you've got something different. I mean, I, I just, did you see it anywhere in the legislation, anywhere? Uh, they said there was $100 million set aside for the th uh, the next quarter or three quarters of the budget. I uh, I heard this from a reporter who, um, you know, was kind of translating it for me and I'm passing it along. So I might have to go back to him and, um, yeah, you know, I, get a better understanding of where that's coming from. I Again, in my conversations uh, with leadership uh, in, you know, with the last budget, uh, I never heard a mention of a hundred million dollars set aside for education. Okay. Did you consider setting aside money in your budget for K to twelve reopening? Well, we have spent a tremendous amount of money uh, for reopening. Uh, we've uh, we've utilized that in a number of different ways. I don't have it all in front of me, but certainly I can get that to you. So it's not as though we didn't anticipate this. Uh, in fact, uh, we did anticipate it, but not to the level of uh, what the apparently uh, the legislature had envisioned. Um, again, had they wanted to put aside $100 million for this reopening, um, we should have worked together to, to provide for that. But uh, again, there's, uh, there's still a time. I'm not sure. I might ask uh, Secretary French to comment on this further, but um, I've heard a lot of talk uh, in in the congressional arena about uh, the opportunity for more money for restart uh, of schools and so forth. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, there there could uh, be money coming from, from Congress. We just don't know at this point. Uh, but we won't know uh, until uh, weeks from now, unfortunately. So um, we'll see what happens. Uh, Secretary French, can you comment on what we have spent uh, thus far? Yes, uh, I think your question pertains to uh, what we call the CRF, the Coronavirus Relief Funds, not necessarily the budget or the general fund. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, we went to the legislature uh, with a proposal and it was ultimately, I think, approved. Uh, Fifty million dollars uh, was the total cost for reopening and that included uh, about six point five million dollars for HVAC or heating ventilation uh, repairs, some twelve million for food service programs um, and so forth. So. The question is, is, has that been sufficient? Um, I think over the summer, I think districts are managing cash flow pretty well. Um, the answer to the question, like, is it sufficient or not, I usually draw a line between what are the reopening costs versus what are the longer term financial impact implications of the emergency. So I think for the moment, we're doing all right. We are, um, tomorrow, I believe, we're collecting information on the CRF or coronavirus requests from schools, so we'll have a better understanding of uh, what might be their need from CRF funds, and um, I know that's a topic of great interest for the legislature. The CRF funds have a short time frame. Uh, they have to basically be expended by this December. I will point out districts also have access to what we call ESSER, the Elementary Secondary Education Emergency Relief Fund. Um, that's about $30 million statewide. Uh, not all districts have really begun to start to draw those funds down, but so once again, my impression is there's adequate cash flow at the moment. Uh, but I do expect there to be longer term financial implications of the emergency. Yeah, just I do have those exact figures up. So we have put forward 50 million in CRF funds in Vermont. There's an additional 31 million in ESSER funds, uh, as you mentioned, Secretary French, and an additional 4.5 million in GEER funds. So we're looking at uh, roughly $85 million that has been put forward. Uh, for reopening costs for schools on top of uh, their standard budgets. Yeah, and as a reminder, any uh, the funding 
that comes from uh, the CARES Act or CRF has to be utilized uh, for COVID-19 expenses, not it can't be utilized uh, for budgetary deficits and so forth. So uh, it's the guidelines are, are fairly rigid um, and we have to adhere to that. And they have to be spent uh, before 1231 at this point in time. We're hoping for more flexibility uh, and that could be a game changer. As I've said, when we present our budget, uh, is, everything is predicated on this having to be spent before 1231. If we were allowed more flexibility, uh, this could be a game changer for us in many different areas, and we would probably want to go back and, and reflect on uh, where we were spending the money. Okay, thank you very much. Matt, NBC5. Thank you. Um, this question is a follow-up, I believe, um, from what John just asked, and I believe it would be directed best towards Dr. Levine in regards to the Killington outbreak. Um, you guys said there's been 14 cases among those who attended and then close contacts. Out of those who attended the event, do you know many, how many people tested positive who were from out of state and from who live in Vermont? And those out of staters, do you know if they came from counties uh, those green counties without requiring a quarantine or if they came from either those yellow or red counties and did not quarantine properly yeah i i think we'll, we'll let dr levine answer but uh but we're trying to get uh, to the bottom of everything at this point and doing the contact tracing takes a little bit of time and trying to uh, get all that information together uh, has been challenging And I can't give you a uh, full breakdown, um, although we publish the cases each night on our daily update, so you'll be able to tell uh, county of residence or if people are out of state from that daily update. The, um, and, and this isn't over by any means. You know, we anticipate there may be several more cases yet, so uh, we'll be able to categorize them the way you're asking, uh, but I don't have that off the top of my head right now. The other point, though, that you're making is uh, if they are out of state, you know, what kind of county are they from? You know, yellow, green, red. Um, and that would also presuppose that perhaps they actually just came for the party and maybe should have quarantined and didn't versus they've actually been at a second home in Vermont or vacationing in Vermont or what have you. Uh, so we, we can't make clear judgments on all of that every time just knowing that they came from out of state as well. But we have a, like I say, a, a large significant proportion that are from Vermont. So um, I wouldn't want fingers to be pointed in any way at any particular part of the population here. Okay, and then just quickly, um, I guess cooperation in regards to this incident from contract tracers. Um, Overall, has it been positive? I mean, have you had any pushback from any of those people who attended from the contract traces at all? Yeah, so starting with the universe of all the outbreaks we've done, I would say it has been extraordinarily positive experience here in Vermont. Going to this specific outbreak, there are a few noteworthy instances where it was not as positive as we've enjoyed elsewhere. So uh, that made this stand out in our mind a little bit more but I don't want to um, cast a, a label or a spell over the majority of people that we've been in contact with uh, who have uh, been very cooperative and who often through their own social network actually had some idea about things anyways and were interested in talking with us further. Um, so it's a, it's a minority that uh, hasn't been totally satisfactory. But it, it is, it, and, and it is improving. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Appreciate it. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Yeah, yes, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, everyone, for hanging in there with us. Um, uh, questions for Secretary Smith. Um, looking at the Education Hub map that uh, you provided and showed earlier, it appears there's um, one in progress in St. Johnsbury. Uh, can any of the details of that uh, proposed site be shared out, um, I'm presumably after the conference? Um, about uh, the facility, the local partner, think details like that. 
Andrew, let me uh, let me check right after the uh, conference on that, and I, I'll get back to you. How's that? Sounds good. And while uh, while you're at the podium, um, the you have 12 proof sites right now that can accommodate 2,300 kids a day. I think you mentioned mm -hmm. um, with hundreds of kids in in each of these hubs uh, at any given point. Can you uh, describe what the daily experience might be like for the kids? Um, and is the state helping define that? Uh, the, the programs on a daily basis, or is that the local partner that's coming up with, with how it'll function? The local partners in, in conjunction with the state will decide how it functions. I don't want you to um, think, for example, I talked about the Essex Juncture Recreation and Parks as a hub site and 700 uh, child uh, care slots. We're not gonna have 700 kids in, in one spot, I just want, people to be aware of that that's going to be in multiple locations at multiple times uh, during multiple days so it will be spread out and we'll keep sort of uh, the smaller groups as we uh, as as we move forward it's I, I just want people to realize that um, you know different kids will be coming on different days uh, because of the the way that the schools are handling their hybrid system, as well as um, you know, there there'll be different locations in here. So I can get I can get sort of the after uh, DCF to give you a call, give you a sort of rundown of how this will work right after this. Okay, thank you. Mara, the Barton Chronicle. Can you guys hear me? Is that you, Lola, or Mara? Yes. Oh. Uh, this is Lola. Go ahead. Can Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so I just wanted to go back to the child care hub. Um, the 12 that have been approved um, that are expected to uh, serve about 2,300 kids a day, are those already, you know, we've talked about how staffing is expected to be a problem. Are those already fully staffed or are we at least confident that they will be? I just want to clarify, um, everybody's using, uh, it's 2,300 slots and that can accommodate uh, 4,600 children. And the reason is, the reason the slots and the children are different is just what I just described. There'll be different days um, in terms of when different children will be attending. Um, in terms, I, I forgot your question, Lola, I'm sorry. Um, that's fine, and so it's accurate to say that it's 2,300 kids a day, right? No, it's 2,300, there's 2,300 slots that can accommodate uh, 4,600 children. All right, yeah. because they'll be attending school on alternating days. That's right. Okay. Um, the question was about staffing. Um, you know, you've acknowledged that that's a major concern here. Are the hubs that are approved, so that are serving, offering those 2,300 slots, um, are those fully staffed? They, I, I don't know the precise answer to your question. Are they fully staffed? Are we looking for staffing right now in order to accommodate those? The answer is yes. Um, but let me, Lola, let me get back to you on whether they're fully staffed. I, I, I I'm confident that they will be. But your 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 question is, are they fully staffed? And I don't know the answer to that right now. Right, and you've also mentioned, you know, being worried about poaching from the existing system. Um, what are you trying to do, or what are these hubs trying to do in order to make sure that that doesn't happen? Well, there is uh, several ways that we can make uh, try to make that happen. First of all, remember, these are going to be temporary hub sites. So, if you've got a permanent job, I would urge you not to go to a 
to a job that's going to be probably temporary in, uh, in, in, in the makeup of, of the job. Uh, there, we can look at contract language, too, to make sure that we aren't poaching. We can also look on the other side as well um, and see if there are ways that we can help with existing staff uh, on, on uh, the current child care system. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if that's a possibility, but I'm willing to open that discussion to see what can be done on that. As you know, we had about a $12 million expenditure for um, uh, that was just approved uh, by the legislature. Um, maybe portions of that can be used to help out in regard to make sure there's no port, uh, poaching. Okay, and one more quick question. Um, what is the uh, cost structure in terms of cost of families um, that we're looking at in these hub sites, um, you know, but are some places offering this care for free? Are they all charging to some extent? Um, the, they're they all are, what are we doing to make? Yeah, oh, the, go ahead. what we will pay for is the startup cost and some of the um, getting in supply costs, getting the startup costs for the rent, making sure there's different things there. On the operational cost, that's up to the provider. And there will be a charge to the parents. Now, we will be able to provide some assistance to parents depending on income. And we have programs in place to uh, provide that assistance uh, depending on income. I can get the sliding scale for you uh, for income eligibility. Matter of fact, we want to promote that. So I will get that to you because we definitely want to promote that, Lola. Right, right. Is there a concern? I imagine this is the, uh, I think, CCFAP um, subsidy? Yeah, that is right. Uh, right, so anyone who's using, um, right, so anyone who's eligible for that would also be eligible for, um, uh, to use it for this program. Is there still a concern that, I mean, for a lot of folks, um, that still doesn't make childcare affordable? So we, we could be looking at, you know, especially like middle class families, the lower middle income families, um, who suddenly have to, pay for child care um, when yes. they used to send their kids to public school for free. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, this initiative is not, um, you're absolutely right, and they used to provide the, their, uh, uh, you know, going to school five days a week w would be through your property, t it's not free, by the way. Um, you're paying it through your taxes, but um, would there be an extra cost? Yeah there will be an extra cost. We're trying to minimize that extra cost as we're designing this system. Are there issues of inequity that you just mentioned? Uh, this initiative, uh, frankly, is not intended to solve the pre-existing challenges that the system is facing. Uh, rather, it's just intended right now to provide additional capacity around the state based on the need we're seeing from the data and the conversations we're having with the communities and and that's what we're trying to do we're trying to minimize the inequity through the various payment programs that we have but nonetheless um, this program probably won't solve all the inequities that were in the in the program before the pandemic hit all right that's all for me thanks ed newport daily express Yeah, good day. Uh, this question uh, is reflective of the, uh, the uh, COVID outbreak at the uh, prison down in uh, Mississippi, I believe it is, where we have uh, a couple hundred Vermonters uh, in prison incarcerated. Is there going to be any type of plan to move them back to Vermont? Um, I think. Secretary Smith can answer that, but uh, you know we're having internal discussions about what we do uh, moving forward. But at this point in time, uh, we wouldn't displace them from where they are. Uh, actually, they're getting through the whole uh, period of time. We're almost uh, two cycles through, uh, so uh, they're better off where they are uh, than coming back uh, here and possibly infecting others. So uh, at this point, we're not bringing them back anytime soon, but uh, we're having the conversations about what we do in the future. Secretary Smith. 
Thank you for the question. Um, just to give everyone an update, we have 219 total Vermonters in the um, facility in um, Tallahatchie um, County Correctional Facility in Mississippi. Uh, total inmates that uh, were positive during the outbreak down there within that facility was 185. That's about 84% of the Vermont population. Uh, good news to report, uh, the total positives that are in recovery, that means they're almost ready to go back to the general population is 172. We have three pods down there. We have positives, we have negatives, and we have in recovery in those three pods um will uh that one pod will disappear probably because people in recovery will move into the, the general population uh, we had we had four total re uh, that refused to take the test down there and they're they're uh treated separately and and quarantined separately one inmate um i i think i mentioned a, a week or two ago that one in inmate was hos uh was uh, hospitalized uh, with COVID, ha that inmate has been uh, released. There are two inmates in the room, the infirmary. Uh, this includes the inmate uh, who was previously hospitalized. There are no other inmates that have uh, concerning symptoms. Uh, we are doing a lot of things now uh, to make sure that they get tested on a regular basis. Those that are negative get tested on a regular basis. And three months from now, testing all the Vermonters that are down there if they're still down there. You asked the question, are we looking at bringing Vermonters back? I think it's gonna be in this COVID environment, it's gonna be a little bit challenging in order to do that, but we're looking at it nonetheless to see if there's any possibility of bringing some or all of those um, uh, patients back. Last, last press conference on Friday, they asked, uh, I was asked the question, are we gonna renew the contract uh, with Core Civic down there. If we renew it, it will only be a one-year renewal, and we'll look at alternatives in the meantime. We are examining internally uh, alternatives right now to see if we uh, renew that uh, contract. I will say it's challenging uh, to bring all 219 back. We may be able to bring partial amounts of that population back uh, over the course of the, this year. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you, thanks everybody. A new record for us, two hours and 25 minutes. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and persevering. Um, but we'll be back on uh, Friday for our modeling and uh, determining the ex uh, vast uh, majority of people that can come to Vermont um, safely. So thank you very much.